Thank you very much, Nelson, for those kind words. I, as walking in, I, he greeted me in Spanish, and I said, wow, where is that Spanish from? <laughs> and he said, I've lived in Panama, so it's, it's a pleasure to be sharing this, this podium with you. Good morning, everybody. It's really an honor to be here today. I've been actually a, an admirer of the Council's work for a, for a long time, first as a student of international affairs, then uh, when I began my career actually here in Washington DC with the Center for Democracy, uh -huh. and later on as a practitioner of development and of democracy and now of diplomacy, you definitely make great contributions to policy making in terms of foreign policy, and that's, I think that's very important. So it's an honor to be here today. I've been told um, that the, the objective is to have a conversation. So I'll try to be brief in these remarks so that we move on to the interesting part of the morning, which is the conversation with, with you. I'll try to make some remarks to uh, let you know a little bit more about my country, where we are right now. And I'd like to begin by referring to, to Panama as, as a global uh, place. And I like to say Panama has been globalized before globalization was in fashion. And that's actually true. Ever since we were, we were born as a republic, we've been, we've been a crossroads of people, of trade, and uh, with the Portobello Fairs, and then through the gold rush, and then, of course, the Panama Canal. And that has really made us who we are as a country, a country really open to the world. And this has been kind of like the basis of one of the principles of our foreign policy and our domestic policy. Uh, in terms of our ability of bringing people together. Latin America enjoys today democracy, pretty much. And not too long ago, I'm sure around these tables, discussion of the dictatorships that took were taking place in the region were every day, uh, 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 happening every day. The guerrilla warfare, we don't have that now, uh, fortunately. And Panama has been part of that democratization of the region. We are proud to have been uh, recuperated our democracy, and for the past 25 years, we've had already five democratically elected government, and we enjoy democracy. Panama, our country, our people, we value democracy, we value freedom of expression, we value uh, a market economy providing opportunities to all of those that wish to seize those opportunities. In terms of our economy, we have a very diversified economy, according to the IMF, we are ranked third as the most economically prosperous country in Latin America. In terms of the World Economic Forum, we've ranked second in terms of competitiveness. In the past 10 years, we've enjoyed a growth of 7.6%, making it one of the fastest growing economies in Latin America. Even during the uh, difficult years recently, Panama managed to continue to grow. We grew over 6% last year. Our, our our uh, projects for this year are also over 6%. And of course, the Panama Canal, which we are very proud to be inaugurating this year, the enlarged Panama Canal, makes an important part of our economy. However, our economy is very diversified and uh, we do not depend on any particular uh, sector of the economy. Our canal is complemented by a worldwide platform of logistics and services one of the best uh, um, ports and airports in the region are in Panama. And with the expanded canal, we, which we are proud to uh, be inaugurating June 26, uh, capacity will triple in terms of volumetric capacity to transit to the canal. And I was actually yesterday at the, at the energy summit um, chaired by Vice President Biden and we were discussing what this canal will offer in terms of the possibility of transit to LNG vessels from uh, the United States Gulf Coast to Asia. So all of these, and given the uh, difficulties of energy in the region and the, and the efforts for integration, there are great opportunities and also possibilities for Panama to once again put our country to the service of the world, to the service of trade and of development in the region. Amidst this growth in economic terms, amidst our democracy, which we are proud uh, uh, to have uh, recuperated, you would ask, where are our challenges? And we do have important challenges in terms of 
development particularly. Our challenges remain in terms of overcoming poverty, in terms of uh, improving social indicators, and that is actually the core of our government plan. Our five-year government plan is concentrated in providing these opportunities to almost four million Panamanians. We have a development um, 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 budget of over $17 million devoted primarily to education, to health. We've come a long way in terms of our uh, poverty indicators, a long way, but we still have uh, important steps to take, and that is our concentration of our, of our government, a country that grows, a country that has the economic indicators that we have, a country that serves the world, has all of the necessary um, capabilities to make this available to all Panamanians. And that is what we're working at. That is our concentration. And uh, these investments in social and infrastructure uh, projects will definitely help us deepen our social welfare, welfare, increase stability, expand human capital, and further develop our infrastructure. In terms of our foreign policy, we base our foreign policy on two pillars. The first pillar being uh, a country that promotes dialogue, that promotes understanding. This has been part of our foreign policy for, for many years. It's kind of who we are as a country, as a result of having been the crossroads of the Americas and of the world for, for a long time. Um, a, a, a sample of this uh, vision was the Summit of the Americas, which we were proud to host last year and which allowed for the participation of all countries from the Americas for the first time ever in the Summit of the, of the Americas. That was the, the, our effort was part of, of that vision of Panama as a country that promotes dialogue, that promotes understanding. Our second pillar in terms of foreign policy is to have an active participation in the global development agenda. And we have been very, very active in these government's terms, in terms of, for example, of human rights, which led to uh, have a, a seat for the first time we were able to have a Panamanian elected to the Inter-American um, Commission of Human Rights for the first time ever. We were elected at the United Nations uh, Commission on Human Rights also for the first time. And our participation in the Sustainable Development Goals, which were agreed upon by many countries last year at the United Nations General Assembly, it's not only a commitment in terms of the global development agenda, but it's at the core of our national government plan. We, ha we have actually um, decided by decree that the SDGs will guide Panama's investments and Panama's social efforts. So in this regard, there is a complete alignment with the global development agenda and our domestic policy. Our participation in the Paris Agreement. Panama e even uh, led a, a, an effort in terms of um, um, the countries that have forest and the efforts that the world needs to make in order to ensure that those countries that have forests can, can keep them and the contribution that this makes to climate change. All of this is, again, a result of this importance that we give to the global development agenda, understanding that that is where the world needs to concentrate its attention. We need, as a world, to overcome the issues of of today, the issues of people migrating from countries where there is war and where there is a lack of opportunities to develop countries, the issues of human rights, which till today are violated in many parts of the world, the issues of incorporating those excluded from development into development. We see this not as um, a, an issue that is apart from our core domestic policy, and we see Panama as a country that can play a role in order to continue to push those efforts. Now, we are today in the f uh, mind frame of many people, not for everything that I've uh, shared with you. We are at the top of mind of many people because of some publications that came out uh, about a month ago already. It seems like a year ago. 
<laughs> so much has happened ever since, ever since that came out. Let me tell you something about the wrongfully called Panama Papers. And I, and I am sure they were named Panama Papers because Panama is a great name. <laughs> Panama is a great name, and this and this journalist needed to have a great name for their publications. And you know, that's her problem for having a great name. But the fact of the matter is that yes, the publications refer to um, business conducted by a law firm in Panama. But furthermore, the publications refer to uh, dealings of banks in 21 jurisdictions none of them in Panama. Not one of the banks that have been mentioned in those publications is based in Panama. The publications refer to offshores, 20% of those registered in Panama, 80% of those registered elsewhere. British colonies, United States, everywhere. The publications really underline that there is a global problem in terms of the financial system. Something that the world has recognized for a long time. And these publications just make it clear that we still have a long, to way, long way to go. We still have a long way to go as, as, a, as a world. It's been hard on Panama that the publications are named Panama Papers. It's been very hard, particularly for our government. I must admit that Panama as a country, we, we came a little late to the efforts of transparency for the financial sector. When, when President Varela was Vice President and Minister of Foreign Affairs during the last government, uh, Panama had not signed one treaty for double taxation. And under his leadership, we established a national commission and we initiated our signing of and negotiating of double taxation agreements, and we signed about 25 at that period of time. And then the alliance broke, and then he left the government, and, and then the previous government didn't do much in terms of this global effort. And when we took office two years ago, Panama was in the gray list of the FATF because we had failed to comply with some of the global efforts. And we initiated a strategy which moved so fast, even recognized so by the FATF. They, I, I heard them at a meeting in Panama say that they had never seen a country move so fast in terms of the decisions that need to be made and the, and the processes that need to be put in place in terms of transparency. And we were able to be removed last year from FATF's gray list as a result of Panama implementing anti-money laundering legislation uh, prevention of money from terrorism into our financial services. We installed the governance institutions that we needed to install, and we got our act together. And we were able to be removed from the great list, and we were able to move to the phase two of the peer review at the OECD. So all of these efforts that our government has been doing and that have been recognized globally because FATF's decision to remove us from the list is a recognition of our efforts and the OECD's transition to phase two of the peer review is a recognition of our country's efforts. It's hit hard by some publications that have our name because our name is pretty nice. <laughs> so we have been in an effort to, uh, again, share with the world what it is that we're doing. And we, yes, there are problems with the financial uh, uh, system around the world problems of which Panama must be a part of its solution, but the rest of the world as well. And we will continue to work in that direction. We are committed, not because of the Panama Papers, we were committed the day we took office and the actions we've taken speak for themselves. But I wanted to take this opportunity to let you know our vision on these publications and what it is that our vision is in terms of transparency in the financial sector. Transparency in general, transparency had been, has been at the core of our government plan. Um, procurement in the past years in Panama has been known, and actually the justice system can say a few things in that regard. Procurement in Panama was really um, permeated by corrupt practices. We have really, really cleaned 
Panama's act in that regard. And uh, you can ask foreign companies now what it is to invest in our government uh, investment plan. And we know what it was to invest previously. So our commitment to transparency in the financial services, in our procurement processes, we are committed to changing politics in Panama to really be what politics needs to be, a service to the people. Politics, not to have a personal agenda, not to enrich yourself, politics to be a tool to serve the people and to serve the country. So our commitment is strong. Our commitment, once again, I, I would like to reiterate, is not the result of uh, responding to some publications. Our commitment has been clear ever since we took office. The, the measures taken speak for themselves. And as I began sharing with you, Panama is a lot more than that. Panama is a country that enjoys democracy, that enjoys freedom of expression, that enjoys economic growth that is fighting to ensure that this economic growth uh, transform into the improvement of life of all Panamanians. And we've seen some important progress in that regard, in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of water and sanitation. And um, our success story is there. I invite you all to come see for yourself. Uh, and more than that, we are truly committed to continue to make Panama a country that shares this prosperity with the rest of the region and that ensures that this prosperity permeates not only Panama, but our neighbors that have difficulties a lot harder than we have. And, uh, and we are working hard in terms of our foreign policy to play that role and, 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 and make sure that the global development agenda, which guides uh, multilateralism and foreign policy uh, in many ways, really reaches the people of Central America, of Latin America, and, and that's what we're committed to. Thank you very much for your attention. Madam Vice President, you touched on uh, one of the issues that I know has been on the forefront of the minds of those here, which is uh, the transparency issues in, in Panama. Uh, your, your boss, your president, President Varela, as you mentioned, was vice president in the prior administration, was foreign minister, and had a uh, very notorious split with President Martinelli because uh, President, Vice President Varela no longer had confidence in the way President Martinelli was governing the country when it came to transparency and corruption issues. And he was, of course, relieved of his duties as foreign minister, but he could not be relieved of his duties as vice president, so he had an empty desk for a number of years, um, which prepared him well to take on the role of running again, running for president and now serving as president. President Martinelli, meanwhile, former President Martinelli, uh, is living in Miami. Uh, Why can't I tell you? <laughs> your government has, uh, your Supreme Court has issued some charges against him. I know you have an extradition request pending. There may be further charges, if one reads the newspapers, there may be further charges coming. What can you tell us about the, uh, the status of President Martinelli here in the U.S. and your efforts to uh, bring him to justice in Panama? Interesting question. Yeah. As you have mentioned, our Supreme Court has a few cases pending on Mr. Uh, Martinelli, former President Martinelli. One of those, which is uh, for the issue of um, rigging telephone uh, conversations, one of those has been approved by the board of the Supreme Court to, under, that, under those charges, request the extradition to the United States. Now, in terms of Panamanian uh, uh, legal framework, the Supreme Court needs to prepare the extradition request 
and submit it to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will be responsible for uh, transferring that request to the United States. We have not yet received from the Supreme Court that request for extradition. Now, we've, of course, uh, evaluated and studied the issue, and it's a complicated uh, situation. We understand in terms of, first of all, our extradition treaty with the United States dates as far as the beginning of the 1900s. <laughs> so the crime by which the Supreme Court is authorized to request the extradition is not part of the treaty. Because of course, at that time, there were no telephones, so even less, there, there was a crime to listen to conversations. Of course, this can all, and we've had discussions with the United States authorities, of course, this can be supported, but that's an issue that we need to deal with. The second issue is that according to the treaty, if we request Mr. Martinelli's extradition based on that um, case, we cannot judge him in Panama for any other case. And he, the cases, I believe, it's, om it's, it's, almost, it's almost 10 cases that are in the Supreme Court regarding Mr. Martinelli right now, and, and, and most of them are a lot more serious than listening in to conversations, which is serious enough. The charges uh, are basically referred to corruption and his participation on corruption practices on our procurement processes and, and uh, even linked to processes that are now at the judicial system in the United States. So another issue that I understand our Supreme Court has is how are we going to request his extradition and make sure in the dealings with the United States that we are not just um, um, protecting him from future um, processes. So those issues are critical issues there, and uh, as, of, as we have been told by uh, our Supreme Court, um, and actually we've discussed with, as mentioned, with uh, US authorities, um, the importance of making a very strong case so that the case doesn't fall through the cracks in the United States system, and we do know that Mr. Martinelli has the resources to hire in, knowledgeable lawyers, and we understand he, he has hired a large number of knowledgeable lawyers. Um, that's, a, that's an issue for Panama. We need to make sure that we can process him properly for all of these issues. Now, that what, that's one thing, the request for extradition, and I do hope that we will request this extradition soon enough. It's not in our hands, uh, but we, we will definitely uh, um, go on with the process once we receive a request. That is, that is one thing. But the second um, thing is what's happening in the United States with the fact that former President Martinelli is living in the United States. Now, I understand that your authorities cannot um, mention, for example, if he has requested asylum. He might have. Some of you might be lawyers and would probably know better than I what happens in terms of a, an extradition request if he's in a, an asylum request process. And I understand asylum request processes can take as long as three years for a decision. And I understand that once this, is, uh, this process is going on, this person cannot be touched. So when and if, Panama requests the extradition, I don't know what's going to happen with the United States system. But what is, what is um, harder, I think, is not this judicial situation that I do hope for Panama's sake uh, goes through, but the thing is that this person is living in the United States, really just dedicated to Panamanian politics through social media. 
So I don't know. That is something that I, I like to pose a question to you. <laughs> you know, it, it just blows my mind. It blows my mind. And, and uh, I, think, I think the world has a long way to go to ensure that uh, we stop protecting those that should be brought to justice. You know, I want to commend you uh, in, your, in your remarks and just now for the candor in which you've addressed some of the most complicated issues facing Panama today, the Panama Papers, uh, the issues with former President Martinelli, the issues of development. Uh, you mentioned also, but I think you swallowed some of the good news, uh, which is, of course, the opening of the, of the new locks in the Panama Canal. Um, Forty years ago here in the United States, Panama was one of the hottest political topics over President Carter's, over actually President Ford and then President Carter's negotiation of a treaty to, to return the canal zone to Panama and to eventually turn over the management of the Panama Canal to the Panamanians. Uh, those who may not have focused on Panama uh, since then uh, might not know that Panama successfully took over the management of the canal and have had a really an unimpeachable for the last 20 years, uh, almost 20 years management of the canal, uh, belying all of the fears and concerns that had been raised at the time. Uh, you've also gone ahead and then moved ahead with a major expansion of the canal to permit much larger vessels to go through. Uh, tell us how, and that will open in June, as you mentioned, tell us how you expect that to impact Panama's economy uh, as well as uh, further the, the global shipping uh, lanes that go through Panama. Thank you for that question because we are very proud in Panama to be inaugurating our expanded canal June 26. And um, let me share with you what uh, I think we're most proud of. And you've mentioned that we've successfully assumed the administration of the canal and that is recognized internationally by, by the trade world and by other countries the transition from US management to Panamanian management was uh, imperceptible to the world. That was, uh, we've, we've done it, we've done it well. But more than that, uh, over 100 years ago, when we began the original canal, we had to turn to the French, and then we had to turn to the United States. But this expansion was done by Panama. And if we look at the investment, which is over 5,000, uh, million dollars in terms of dollars in that time, we're building a second canal. This is a major infrastructure project, um, and we're very proud to be inaugurating the canal and, and being uh, a, Panamanian, a Panamanian project funded by Panama, led by Panama, contracted by Panama. And this just uh, shows what Panama is, is capable of and this will represent uh, a major transition to world trade. I mentioned uh, the LNG vessels, for example, that will be able to transit through an, an enlarged canal. The administrator of the canal was just saying a few days ago that ever since the inauguration was announced, uh, they've just been receiving the bookings. And it's booked for, for, for its initiation. Uh, the, the world, the maritime sector has been expecting the expansion of the canal and we're just there ready to jump as soon as it was uh, finalized and, and, and that's great news. An enlarged canal will represent uh, important uh, additional revenues for Panama. One of the most important things from the, transfer, for the, from the transfer of the canal to Panamanian management is that under US administration, the canal was managed uh, um, in terms of uh, its budget. It was managed uh, money that came in, money that, was, that came out. It, there were no revenues for Panama nor the United States. That was definitely changed when Panama assumed administration and the canal is today an important source of uh, in income for our national budget. And an expanded canal will increase that dramatically, and we are, um, we are waiting for those resources in order to divert them to what I have mentioned is our most important challenge, which is development. Uh, 
uh, as, as mentioned earlier, our challenges in terms of water and sanitation are, are amazing. You go to Panama City, I don't know if you've been recently, if you haven't been recently, you should go. You go to Panama City and, and Panama City looks like New York City. But in, in a country where we have a city that is booming, uh, we have sectors of our country that are excluded. And we're working hard at uh, ensuring that our human development indicators just, just jump and the resources that we will receive from an expanded canal will definitely be di diverted into that, into that direction. I'm going to turn now uh, to the audience. Uh, those of you who have questions, uh, I'll ask you first to uh, tell us who you are, what institution you're with, and then to keep your questions uh, brief, fierce, and decisive. Um, well, the press has an interest in asking questions, so let me turn to the table here. The woman in the, uh, in the red jacket, please. Hi, uh, welcome, uh, Madam Secretary. My name is Nadia Chow, Washington correspondent for Liberty Times. I have two questions. The first one is uh, for the uh, inauguration. Panama already uh, extended the invitation to Taiwanese president-elect Tsai Ing-wen and both Chinese president Xi Jinping. Uh, I wonder, uh, are you expecting both of them to attend? Because uh, Madam Tsai already expressed his interest to you know, participate. Uh, the second question, that Panama paper, more detail were coming on Monday, next Monday, and you said that Panama has been hit hard by this paper. Could you elaborate, you know, if more details coming, what impact will be on Panama's economy? Thank you. Thank you very much. On the first question, yes, we have extended invitations to both the president of uh, China, Taiwan, and the president, president of uh, People's Republic of China. Panama has diplomatic relations with Taiwan, and Panama has commercial relations with China. We have an office in China, uh, we have an office in Hong Kong, and we have an office in Taiwan, and we have invited to the inauguration of the Panama Canal the uh, commercial sector of the world, and we have invited heads of state. Now, what has defined which heads of state we have invited? We invited about 40 heads of state, uh, the decision has been based primarily on the, those uh, countries that are the primary users of the Panama Canal. And, uh, and China is one of the primary users of the, of the Panama Canal. So we would love to have them both, definitely. This is, a, this is a, an event where Panama um, places ourselves once again to the service of world trade and world, world commerce, and we hope to, to share this celebration with, uh, with the rest of the countries that participate of this, of this service that Panama provides. Um, regarding the second question, yes, we've, we've heard that there is a, a second round of uh, information coming. I said Panama has been hit hard because the, it bears Panama's name, but many countries have been hit hard because the information that has come out here touches, as I mentioned, 21 jurisdictions in terms of banking, uh, many other jurisdictions in terms of the registration of offshores. And furthermore, people uh, that have a, a, a public life um, all over the world. What can come of those, of those uh, publications? I would imagine uh, more information on, on, on people that are, have uh, um, offshores or, or that have uh, registered uh, uh, businesses. And uh, we're just as expecting as the rest of the world uh, of these new publications. Good. Yes, here at the front table. Good morning, thank you for joining us. Claire Brillenborg of the law firm Foley Hoag. I wanted to ask, given Panama's historic role as a leader in the region and also given your close relationship with the United States, how the opening of the relationship between the United States and Cuba has affected Panama? The opening of the relationship between the United States and Cuba, it's great news to Latin America. It's not only great news to Panama, but it's great news to Latin America. It, it was a it was something that 
that needed to happen at some point. We are very proud to have been the venue where our, the President of the United States and the President of Cuba met for the first time over 50 years. And it's interesting that the last time they had met before the Summit of the Americas, the last time a President of the United States and a President of Cuba had met was in 1956 in Panama. So we take pride in being a country that brings people together, that brings countries together. We have been open to the world um, forever to, due to our geography, geographic location. Uh, Panama has been a crossroads of people, of culture, of trade. And that has made us open to the world and that has made us a country that, that takes pride in, in bringing people and countries together. So that's great news. And uh, we do hope it will continue to move, to move forward. You know, let, let me ask a question that follows on the one about the expansion of the Panama Canal, because uh, this, the opening of the canal and the new locks actually touches on another topic of global concern, because uh, there may not be enough water to fully power uh, the locks going forward, as I understand, for, at least for the moment, because of El Nino. It's not everyone may know that the, one of the miracles of the Panama Canal is that it's fed entirely by the waters of the rainforest in the interior of Panama. There are no pumps. It's not recirculated. The water starts in the interior of Panama and then flows through the locks into the sea. Uh, because of El Nino, uh, you haven't, you've had a drought. Uh, some have linked El Nino and this particularly severe El Nino to uh, climate change. Uh, what is Panama doing? to both address the, the immediate issue of the water uh, that it needs for the, for the locks and the broader question uh, of climate change? Uh, well, I'll begin with the second question. First, the broader question of climate change, as mentioned, we were very active in the negotiations towards the Paris Agreement. We think that's great news to the world that the world has finally reached an agreement in terms of climate change. The implementation will definitely be difficult uh, there is a question here of the cost of uh, uh, taking measures and who bears the cost. When I mentioned the Air Force of Panama, which led, Panama led a coalition of 52 countries towards the negotiations of the Paris Agreement, 52 countries that have uh, forest. And the, and the proposal of these uh, 52 countries was basically uh, what do we do to conserve this forest and who foots the bill? Because at the end, there is a cost to development when you commit to conserving your, your forest. And forests are basically in the underdeveloped world. So countries like the United States will have uh, an important role to play in, in, this, in this effort towards climate change. Locally, we are doing a lot of things. We have a, we have a strong uh, leader of the efforts right now in Panama, which is our Minister of Environment. She's been an advocate of uh, environment for a long time. She's been trained uh, in, in, in re environment, and she's working hard in this uh, regard. We have a project of uh, reforesting Panama, uh, which is going very well, and, and we're just really turning around how we manage uh, environmental processes in, in Panama, and, and we've really raised uh, the, the commitment of our government in, to, in terms of, uh, of uh, environment in general. Now, the water for the canal. The issue is that the lakes that feed the canal are also the lake that feed the Panamanian uh, population for drinking water. So yes, this is an important issue. The good news is that the new canal does recirculate water. So the, the locks that ha were built at the beginning of, of the last century, they work throwing that water into the sea, but the new locks work recir recirculating water. So that's good news. Um, we have President Varela mentioned last year at his speech at the National Assembly a uh, project that we need to look into uh, soon, which is a project to uh, build further water reserves in Panama. And the lakes that feed the canal are man-made lakes, are lakes that were 
uh, made for the canal, and they now provide the drinking water to the city. Uh, there, there is a lot of water in, in Panama. We need to work at preserving this, this water, and there is an area uh, of Rio Indio where there are several rivers uh, come together, and we're looking towards, in the future, uh, just uh, building a large new uh, water reservoir, reservoir. Now, the other good news is that in Panama, we had El Nino, but in Panama, when it starts raining, it starts raining. <laughs> and last week, it started raining, and then we had floods. <laughs> so fortunately enough, um, the dry season has, has uh, it's over. The lakes will uh, re, um, how do you say that? They will regain replenish. The, replenish, thank you. Replenish with water. But that's an issue that Panama needs to look into for the future the issue of water for the canal and water for, for our population. We are, we're fine for the, for the next, um, you know, for the near future, mm -hmm. but uh, long term, we're already looking into additional projects that will ensure the supply of water. Mm -hmm. Yes, the gentleman at the back uh, table. Thank you. Madam Secretary, this is Alex. I am the Washington correspondent of United Daily News of Taiwan. I have a question with regard to diplomatic tie between Panama and Taiwan. We know Panama and China had a robust uh, economic tie with China and have diplomatic tie with Taiwan. And Panama has been expressed its willingness to establish diplomatic tie with China before. And my question is, um, how would you describe the diplomatic relation between Taiwan and Panama at present? And is so-called dual recognition a possible way to figure out the diplomatic issue among Panama, Taiwan, and China? Thank you. We have... Uh, diplomatic relations with, with Taiwan. We have very good diplomatic relations. Um, we have, as I, as I have mentioned, commercial relations with China. We understand uh, the two Chinas have an agreement, uh, currently a truce, which we respect. And um, we are very respectful of uh, the way they handle their our relations and their approachment. It's been a long process uh, for them. Uh, meanwhile, we are friends of Taiwan and have diplomatic relations with uh, Taiwan, and we have strong relations, commercial relations with, with China. And we do hope that both of them will uh, continue to become stronger. Yes, sir, over here. Hello, uh, Steve Rodriguez. I, uh, I'm a venture capitalist, but I spent some time in the region with uh, the U.S. Mill Group in Colombia. Uh, my question, uh, Madam Vice President, is <clears throat> uh, your country sits at the crossroads uh, of a number of important issues related to terrorism, um, epidemiology, and, of course, trade. Um, I guess my, my question is not so much uh, getting a current update of where things are. I, I can read uh, <clears throat> plenty of papers that have been written here in D.C. on that. My question is, how do you view your country's role it, at the crossroads of so many of those issues going forward? Those issues that are global issues are, we, we are having to face them um, as well as the rest of the world. And I'll, I take the opportunity of your question to, to refer to one particular uh, issue which is uh, difficult for us and which is a current affair, and is a situation of migrants going through the isthmus on their way to the United States. For the past years, many years, there have been there has been a a flow of migrants through the Central American isthmus to reach the United States. Now the flow is made up of uh, Cubans 
many of them wanting to reach the United States, uh, um, you, given the policy that the United States has of, of welcoming uh, um, my Cuban migrants. And there has also been a flow of um, people from another continent. There is a flow of uh, people from Africa, from Asia. These uh, people enter the continent, most of them through Brazil or Ecuador. Brazil and Ecuador both have a migrant policy that they're open to the world and they, they don't require visas for many nationalities. And I think it's a drama. I think it's a human drama to have people that flee their countries with their families. We have people going with their young children. We have pregnant women. We have entire families. And you know, the issue of refugees in Europe, it's very visible right now because they're coming in large numbers. The issue of migrants going through the Central American Isthmus towards the United States, it's a smaller number than the refugees in Europe, so it's not as known. But it's a human drama. It's a human drama that people have situations in their country in terms of wars, in terms of lack of economic opportunities that are so dramatic that they're willing to risk everything to find a better livelihood. And I, and I really think the world needs to look into what's happening in these countries. The, the response is not, is not closing the gates. Because at some point, I don't know if you can close the gates. I mean, look, look what's happening in Europe. But I think the response needs to be a coherent, integral response addressing the issues of development and the issues of peace are countries that are far away from us, but that have, have these issues and, and uh, the issue of migrants right now, we have 3,900 Cubans in Panama that cannot move to Costa Rica because Costa Rica closed the frontiers. And Costa Rica closed the frontiers because Nicaragua closed the frontiers. And we cannot close the frontiers with Colombia because we don't have a frontier with Colombia. We have a jungle on our, on, our, on our frontier with Colombia. So what are we to do? Are we to move these families with four, three, two-year-old children into the jungle, which we actually did with a few of them a couple of weeks ago when a four-year-old got lost? And then we sent our police, after sending our police to stop them from coming in, we sent our police to look for the, car, the kid. Because what are you going to do? Ignore this human drama? I mean, we cannot be a world talking about a global agenda and talking about poverty and talking about human rights at the tables at the UN and then looking to the other side when there are people that are willing to risk everything because they have no future at their original countries. I don't see an easy response. Panama's gonna have to do something at some point. We're gonna have to, I don't know, send the uh, Cubans back to Cuba, send them to Ecuador, which issued the visas. They have Ecuadorian visas. They don't have visas from Colombia. They don't have visas from Panama. We received about 400, a few months ago, about from 400, 390 uh, people from Congo. And we were like, what? 390 in one month? We've, we've had people from Senegal, from Congo, you know, two, three. They come through Brazil and they walk their way up to the United States. Can you believe this? So we were like, this doesn't make sense, you know, 390. Well, we've, we have some uh, agreements with the United States and some systems to identify some people through their... Um, what do you call this? The fingerprints. Fingerprints, thank mm -hmm. you. Because they, they claim they don't have papers. They 
they lose their papers because they don't want to be sent back. And if countries don't know where they're from, you cannot send them back. They were Haitians. They were Haitians claiming to be from Congo. So th this is a human drama that the world needs to start looking at. And I don't think the result is to close the gates. I think the result is to push development in these countries. And I don't think we can any longer pretend that this does not affect us because we thrive in development and economic prosperity because this is not so far away when these people are every day coming into our own countries. Well, thank you for that very articulate uh, description of the issues involved. Uh, our country is about to embark on a, on a debate on this very issue, a presidential debate, and is one of those who believes that America is much stronger when it welcomes those from around the world. Um, uh, I personally welcome your articulate comment, although it was not intended to be a comment at all uh, affecting our own political debate here. Other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Tony Perez, I'm a uh, wait for the uh, microphone, yeah, sir. Thank you. My name is Tony Perez. I'm a professor at Catholic University. And earlier in my career, I had the, the lack of fortune of working on international extradition matters. So I was intrigued by your comment about the Martinelli situation. Uh, the United States for the last 30, 40 years, to my knowledge, has been seeking to renegotiate extradition treaties into the modern um, dual criminality format. And I was wondering, um, if I understood you correctly, Panama has not yet joined in that process. And I was wondering if you're changing your view about it and whether or not you could utilize that change to extradite Mr. Martinelli. And the follow-up question is, are you really better off with Martinelli in Panama or in Miami? <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to answer your second question. <laughs> uh, we would welcome the renegotiation of a treaty. I don't think we have a, we have a formal uh, request. We have not initiated a request. Now, the negotiation of those agreements, which need to be passed by our legislative bodies, are not so quick. So I don't know if we should be waiting for that uh, to deal with this and other cases. We certainly could uh, move into that direction for, for the future. Um, and I take the Fifth Amendment on your second question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, here at the back table. So, uh, Wait for the microphone, sir. Thanks. So um, thank you very much, Madam Vice President, for being here. And congratulations on the new government's commitment uh, to transparency and to development issues. Uh, so my name is Ty Grinberg. I'm at Georgetown Law. Um, important, I guess, also relevantly, I was previously at the United States Office of International Tax Council, where I worked on offshore tax evasion issues. Uh, in prior governments, uh, Panama developed a reputation as being perhaps the most recalcitrant of the major um, or significant financial intermediary jurisdictions around the world with respect to offshore tax ev evasion issues. And in this government, um, you've only recently joined the common reporting standard, which is kind of the new globally accepted standard for um, uh, what countries will do to try to address offshore tax evasion. I think you did that last week. Uh, given this history, I think there's sort of this reputational question that Panama faces. Um, and, and the question is, just tangibly, are there things Panama is prepared to do besides kind of the bare minimum to get off the, OK, they're different than everyone else list? Um, that you're prepared to share with this audience. So that would include, for example, changes in rules about how uh, lawyers and accountants do due diligence, rules about beneficial ownership. There are a variety of things that uh, Panama could do to change the way it's perceived. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that. Well, definitely. Um, and actually, some of the things that you've mentioned, we've already done uh, in this past uh, 20 months in, in government. Uh, we, know, we have very strong Know Your Client legislation in Panama. Actually, I, I invite you to go to Panama and try to open a bank account. It's a lot harder than opening a bank account in the United States. Um, we have uh, Know Your Client legislation. Uh, we have due diligence uh, legislation. The previous government approved a legislation uh, changing barrier chairs and uh, uh, making it um, obligatory for lawyers to know the end um, owners of, uh, of um, shares. And they, they passed the legislation and they placed it in a hold for five years until 2018 or something like that. 
we reinstalled that legislation, which was placed into effect January 1st this year. So today, um, important changes has, have been made to, to our legislation. Now, there is a question that I don't think is that well known in terms of our commitment and in terms of our actions. And, and I think it's something that needs to be put into the table and, and just figure out how we deal with it. And, and it's part of our reality. First of all, our uh, taxing legislation, we do not tax Panamanians for um, income generated outside of Panama. That is our system, which works well for us. Now, we respect other countries' system. And we, res we are committed to helping other countries follow the money of their own citizens that try to hide their money in other jurisdictions. We, we are committed to assisting those countries, and we will continue to, e to do everything that we can to assist those countries. However, the cost of implementing the common reporting standards is going to be very high on our financial system. And we're going to do it. But figure, I mean, nobody has put into the table what it represents for a small country to ensure that you commit to certain standards because other countries needs, need that information you don't. There is a large cost in terms of operations for banks if they're going to exchange of, uh, information our taxing um, authority can barely collect taxes in Panama. I mean, we have our own problems of tax evasion that we're working hard at, at uh, uh, conquering. Now, we don't only need to con concentrate now on uh, um, strengthening our taxing authorities in order for them to collect the taxes that we need to improve the livelihoods of Panamanians. But now we need to make sure we strengthen our tax authorities so that they can share information with the rest of the world, with countries that are a lot more powerful and have a lot more resources than we do. Now we're going to do it. We think it's fair that we do it. But you need to know there is a cost involved here. And that is something that I think needs to be brought into the table at some point. Because it's like, it's like developed countries, and I understand the need for additional resources. And I understand the need to go after your own citizens that find whatever way to evade taxes. And, 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 and so international legislation has just been getting stronger to uh, move that fence. And, and in the process, you're setting up some standards to the rest of the world that, that are standards that bear a high cost to your own system at the, at the cost of your people, at the cost of money you need for development. So I, I just wish, since you're in, in that area, you know, I just wish that that reality was also placed on the table. Now, regarding are we willing to do something more than just committing to the bare minimum? Yes. I, I would love to see my country become a leader in terms of transparency. And this is something that we've debated. Locally, we've installed an international committee of expert, experts. As, as uh, last Friday, we installed it as part of the measures that we've taken to uh, respond to the information that has come out through the Panama Papers and, and as a part of our commitment to, to improve our, our system. A committee to be co-chaired by Nobel Peace Prize, Prize Joseph Stiglitz. Now, we all know where Professor Stiglitz's views are in terms of transparency and in terms of development, and uh, we are um, committed to just 
waiting for the recommendations of that committee and see what information they provide there that will help us uh, be better. And yes, I would love to be at the forefront, but you've got to understand, just committing to what we've committed, it's, it's not an easy thing. We are having to face questions of whether we devote money to education or we devote money to the standards. It's not an easy, it's not an easy position to be in. But yes, we're committing and, and, uh, and we are working in that direction. Well, we've just crossed the 9.30 hour. Uh, and so as, I, as we bring matters to a close, let me note that uh, in this country, we have a long tradition uh, of vice presidents who use the job as a platform for other jobs. We have a more recent tradition of, uh, of secretaries of state, foreign ministers, even women secretaries of state, uh, using that as a position for further jobs. And uh, I commend that to Panama. Thank you all. Thank you all for, thank you for joining us here. Thank you all. Please join me in welcoming and thanking thank the vice president. <laughs>